Uh, you've really seen the sort of opposite way of that since he left, really, and, and mm. the sort of scenario that Ferrari are in at the moment in Formula One. So the cars are being pushed now uh, down towards the, the house for the, for the Michael Schumacher moment. Not only 25 years since his first World Championship victory in 1994, but also 50 years since his birth back on the 3rd of January 1969. Grew up in Kirpen in Germany and uh, then moved into racing in go-karts, predominantly at his father's circuit, which was actually built by Wolfgang von Trips back in the day. And uh, then moving on to race in Formula Ford, which of which we have here, the 1988 Formula Ford, the Van Diemen RF88 that he raced, then into German Formula 3, then into a little bit of sports cars before being picked up by Eddie Jordan for that uh, one race at Spa in 1991. He was swiftly negotiated out of that <laughs> contract. I'm not sure negotiated is quite the right word, but he was extricated from that contract to join Benetton for 92 and 93. First World Championship in 94, followed by the second one in 1995, then moved to Ferrari at a time where Ferrari was struggling. Only won one race in 95 uh, with Jean Alesi in Canada and then Schumacher moved there alongside Eddie Irvine and with him and Jean Todd and uh, Ross Braun and Rory Byrne that would come along that started the huge success and look at that that's Damon Hill by the looks of things at the wheel of the 1994 Benetton that collided with him at the Adelaide Grand Prix back, uh, back at the end of the season there. And so then Schumacher went on to that incredible run of form, had those superb battles with Hakkinen in 1998 and 1999, and then finally won the first world championship for Ferrari since Jody Schechter in 1979. And it was Schumacher's third world title. Then there were the years of dominance up to 2004. 2005 and six, Fernando Alonso and the Renault team took the titles and uh, Schumacher had a Retirement, uh, perhaps slightly enforced retirement, then a little bit of a return. And I think the biggest shame is we see Corinna Schumacher and uh, Jean Todd walking up the hill. One of the biggest shames of, uh, of his career was, and uh, Luca de Montezemolo there as well behind, was that 2012 Monaco Grand Prix where he set the fastest time in qualifying after he'd come back into Formula One but he was, had a three-place grid drop or something mm. for an incident in the last race, so never, never got another <coughs> pole position upon his return. And people also forget just how versatile Michael Schumacher had been on his way to Formula One because he was picked up by Mercedes as part of the junior programme. He had a sports car career with success. Carl Wendlinger was part of that. Fritz, Fritz Kreutzpoitner was part of that, but it was, it was Michael that had by far the best results. He also drove for Mercedes uh, on occasions in the DTM. There's an example of his DTM Mercedes there. He uh, had a part to play in the outcome of a championship there as well, as Johnny Giacotto would testify. Uh, but you think of him more as Formula One, but he raced at Le Mans, he raced sports cars internationally, he, he had a touring car spell. Uh, there was more to Michael Schumacher's career than just winning those seven world championships and 91 Grand Prix. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, he also then went to, to do a bit of motorcycle racing, didn't That's right. he? After, yeah. He, uh, yeah. after his uh, first retirement and uh, ended up sort of uh, stopping that for, for a while. But... Uh, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. He would race absolutely anything there, Michael Schumacher, Toby Moody. He did a few races in the German Superbike Championship, uh, but mm. also he tested quite a lot for Ducati. He did some laps alongside Randy Mamola. He did a couple of laps on the back of the Ducati two-seater. And um, as with four wheels, he did long test sessions, long days, took his helmet off, not a single <laughs> bead of sweat. And uh, you've both, for both disciplines, of course, we all know you need to be hyper fit, but in different ways. And he gelled uh, very quickly indeed. He actually did some laps on a Border Honda in, uh, in Germany for that uh, Superbike Championship. He also did some laps aboard a, uh, a KTM as well, uh, sort of behind the scenes under the radar with some, uh, some colleagues of mine. But yeah. Um, we were all there at those Grand Prix, weren't we, guys? You know, the battle between Damon and uh, uh, Michael at Silverstone and, uh, you know, Lady Diana was giving out the trophies, That's you know, right. he, yeah. that, those years. It was, it was top stuff. In, in a way, though, he, uh, unfairly, perhaps, became almost a pantomime villain. You know, there was the, the, the British fans cheered for Damon and there was the, the, the Adelaide incident. There was then the incident with Jacques Villeneuve. And, and, and maybe, in Britain, Michael didn't get the recognition that he deserved. You're quite right, David. And when you, you know, read some stuff and Damon talks about the past, 
you know, Damon went to Hockenheim, but with police escort, you know, mm, <laughs> you mm, know let's mm. look at it, as the you say, from the, the other side of the coin. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There is Damon Hill, who, as Toby was saying, had that uh, clash with him in Adelaide in 1994, the old photograph of the car up on two wheels, and uh, Damon out, Michael inheriting the championship, even though he was a retirement from the race too. Every world champion is the best in the world for that year. You don't, they don't just give out race wins, they certainly don't give out world championships. But, you know, with the, with the work ethic that he put in, the thing that sort of swung it for me was, uh, you know, Ross Braun saying he had a little notebook on the side of his bed and he'd wake up in the middle of the night and think, ah, what we need to do for turn five at Silverstone is maybe try this. You know, it was that Senna level of mental computation that wasn't just, OK, we're done now, boys. Let's jump in the hard mm. car and go for a meal at the yep. hotel. Yep. It, was, it was 25 hours a day that his brain was trying to work out what can I do to, make, to, to get the biggest advantage before the green lights go out. And Jack, isn't it also go true on. that he, he would um, make sure he knew the name of every mechanic in that garage and say good morning to them and say goodbye to them at the end of the day before he left? There was, there was that element that endeared him to the team. Well, I think that was the, the, the big part about it to, uh, to go to 1996 when he joined Ferrari, was the galvanizing the team around him. Not only, you know, with Luca de Montezemolo and Ross Braun and everyone at the, at the top of the team, but everyone in Ferrari wanted to do well mm -hmm. for Michael Schumacher. And Toby touched on this as well, that Michael would arrive on the podium looking as fresh as a daisy, not a bead of sweat, and that was another way that he beat the opposition because he got into their brains. He was able to, to get into, uh, into their psyche because they would look tired and they'd be worn out after a, a tough race. And uh, there was uh, Michael looking so fresh. So we will acknowledge uh, a great, not just Formula One career, but motor racing career as well, very shortly. Uh, and I think that's key with the fitness, isn't it? Because you look at, you remember Ayrton Senna when he got out of cars in the early mm. 90s and he was so tired and he could barely lift the trophy and all yeah, those exactly. dramatic yeah. things, which were great and we love. And, and then Schumacher would turn up and he'd just hop out of the car as if he hadn't done anything. And this, mm. these were kind of similar-ish eras yeah, that's and true. so the fitness that he took to, a, to oh, a whole new level absolutely right there's an example of one of the early cars the Michael Schumacher Van Diemen RF88 Billy Bergmeister's team ran that car uh, in German Formula Ford in the European uh, Formula Ford championship let's have a look then at the career of Michael Schumacher the car the uh, Formula Ford uh, the uh, 1988 Van Diemen in the background, the Sauber Mercedes that Michael drove behind that, you've got the 190 DTM Mercedes that was also uh, part of uh, his career, as we can have a look at Michael's career.
Great reception as we look back on a wonderful Formula One career of a truly great Formula One world champion, Michael Schumacher. Statistically, the greatest Formula One driver of all time. Many would say the greatest Formula One driver of all time. There's an incredible selection of his Ferraris, the F2004 that was so dominant that year. You've got the Mercedes that he made his return in in 2010 in the comeback down there and the fireworks going off behind the house. Corinna Schumacher, his wife, Jean Todd, the president of the FIA, Luca de Montezemolo, Ross Braun was down there as well. This is the 1997 Ferrari with which he had that great battle for the title with Jacques Villeneuve. And there is Corinna and Jean Todd. Fantastic to have them all here at the house celebrating uh, Michael Schumacher at 50 and 25 years since that first Formula One world title. There's Ross Braun to, uh, to the back and to the left there. And of course the Duke of Richmond as well. That's the 1994 car that he won his first title in. And so many people there that have shaped the career, be it uh, through Benetton and or Ferrari. Uh, Look at Montezemolo uh, being instrumental in the Ferrari period with uh, John Todd. Let's have a look at some of the other cars that uh, were driven by Michael Schumacher. Well, there was his Mercedes comeback on the on the right hand side, then the Formula Ford from 1988, and you you just don't. For me, you, when you think of Michael Schumacher, you're not thinking of those last three cars, are you? It's, it's okay. quite astonishing to see them. That's why I keep going on about yeah. this versatility, because this bit people don't really accept. You know, he, he was put with Jochen Mask, ex Grand Prix driver, sports car champion, in one of these cars. And, and it was always of the three juniors from that Mercedes program, uh, Michael, that was, was just far and away the, the better of the three drivers. And, and you could see the career was, was going to blossom, Toby. Don't forget that Carl Wendling is here today as Indeed, well. Yeah. He was, was a part teammate, of that. Yeah. Was part of that crew, exactly, David. And, uh, you know, there must have been a huge bonding as the youngsters travelled the world, had their eyes made wide, more and more wide open, mm -hmm. uh, forgive my English, as they, as they got into these big cars and got quicker and quicker and, of course, eventually got to the heady heights of Formula One. You know, they were, uh, they were dominant times, dominant times. And can you imagine, you know, the the feeling as the guys left Maranello going to a Grand Prix, you know, with a championship lead, they're on more than the crest of a wave. It doesn't happen very often. It's that sort of Valentino Rossi kind of level, Sebastian Loeb kind of level of domination that just comes around arguably once a decade, maybe even once every two decades. Nice to see Georgia Hill there mm -hmm. as well, wasn't it? As uh, you're absolutely right, Toby, looking at all those Ferraris that just steamrolled through that era of Formula One. I mean, looking at that footage, there were some great world championship showdowns that Michael Schumacher was involved in, but also a, a mid-season championship win. Yes, he, uh, you remember he got so close to winning the championship before he won the championship with Ferrari to get his third one. You know, it was Hakkinen at Suzuka, battle, battle, battle. Nearly did it, nearly did it, didn't quite mm -hmm. do it. Wasn't there a Malaysia close showdown as well? Yeah. I seem to remember. But I made a point of finding a television because I was away that weekend because I wanted to see Ferrari win the championship again. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was the adversary of 1999, wasn't there, when he went off at Stowe and, uh, right, uh, and broke his legs at Silverstone. And Eddie Irvine took over the, the mantle for Ferrari at that point. Um, but he came back from that to win five of those championships. Absolutely superb. So let's go down to Tom Clarkson, who is one of the key men in the history of Michael Schumacher. Ross, what an incredible collection of cars, incredible collection of memories as well for you. Yes, yeah, I've been involved in most of them, actually. Yeah. So um, it's got uh, even the uh, sports car I raced against. I was a Jaguar when we were racing, and that's when we first really noticed Michael. That was when he made a big impression on myself, Tom Walkinshaw. And so when the opportunity came for him, get him in Formula One, then... Uh, it was an easy decision for us. A bit, bit troublesome at the beginning, but we got there. Well, yes, of course, when you're getting him from Jordan. But yes. what impressed you? When you look back on those years with Michael Schumacher, what was it that made him such a special driver? Uh, well, I think anyone at his, his level has to have the, the natural talent. Um, you, know, you can work as hard as you like, but you haven't got that natural talent, that inner gift, then you're not going to succeed. But when you marry that inner gift with the approach and dedication and commitment he had and his character i mean he you know people he endeared himself to people within the team everybody wanted michael to succeed because uh, of the way he behaved the way he behaved to them 
I mean, everybody could see the commitment that he had, and everyone wanted to try and match that and, and give the same amount of commitment. So Michael was a huge catalyst for the teams he was in, as well as just being a sensational racing driver. Um, but he just had everything, and I think he raised the level of what a professional racing driver should be to a point where now all the guys are fit, they properly train, they, they know the levels they have to commit to. And he set new standards. And what was it like to be on that role? He, he won 91 races, those five world championships at Ferrari in particular. What was it like to just be on the crest of a wave like that? Well, it was great to hang on to his <laughs> shirt tails, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, very special. I mean, the, the tendency in Formula 1 is you're always looking forward. You don't look back because uh, you've got the next challenge, you've got the next race, you've got the next championship. So often when you have that success, you don't perhaps enjoy it as much as you could. Uh, it's what we're there for. But there's still a, still a tension of we've got to do this again or we've got the new challenge, we're thinking of a new car. Uh, so reflecting back on it now, I've retired from racing. Um, it makes it very special. And especially seeing all these cars here today bring back great memories. And right. lots of the mechanics are here as well, which is extra fun, because some of the guys who I work with at Ferrari have moved on and they're now looking after these cars. So it's great to see lots of the old mechanics. Great to see them. Great memories too. Thank you, Ross. Thanks. Fascinating to hear from Ross Braun. I've forgotten the, the you, Jaguar Mercedes rivalry link to Michael Schumacher, but uh, all part of uh, that great rivalry of sports car racing, and you can see how Formula One became aware of him. Now, one of Michael Schumacher's great rivals, Damon Hill, he's with Nicky Shields. So I'm here with Formula One champion, Damon Hill. Um, Damon, obviously Michael was a huge rival of yours throughout the years, yeah. um, but today you're driving the 94 Benetton. Uh, tell us about your memories from that year, 1994. Well, 94 was uh, a tumultuous year, really, with this, starting off with, uh, with the, uh, what happened at Imola and, and Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger, and then the battle carried on with me, and I ended up in a title fight with Michael Schumacher. Uh, right down to the wire. We had a fantastic race in, in Japan, in Suzuka. And then we went to Adelaide, where I had this fateful coming together uh, with Michael, and Michael became world champion, which is his first Formula One world championship. Uh, now, tell us about how you, you know, consider Michael. This, obviously, the theme of this year is, is Speed Kings. Michael Schumacher is clearly one of the Speed Kings. Do you think he is the all-time best Formula One driver that we've seen? Well, the way it works is you, they measure it with the number of championships and race wins. So currently, yes, he is. Uh, Lewis is catching up, uh, but, you know, it's a long way to go yet before you can equal Michael's record. And there's no question that the guy had the most outstanding ability as a racing driver. And he, he, uh, he uh, had the qualities that you need to be successful. Uh, you know, a little bit of ruthlessness, uh, a lot of talent and a lot of concentration and dedication. What's your best memory? Of racing against Michael? Uh, it has to be racing against him in the wet in, in 94. And uh, I, I even got a pat on the head at the end of it. He thought I did okay, so that was good. <laughs> Excellent, right. Well, I think the cars have started their entries. We can hear them loud and clearly. I think that's your cue to get in the Benetton. Enjoy the drive. Thanks, Damon Hill. Great to hear from Damon Hill there. That's a 1994 race at Suzuka. A rather unusual one. It was an aggregate race. and. Um, uh, Pat Simmons subsequently said that that was the one time in his whole time working with Michael Schumacher where Michael maybe didn't quite figure out what he was meant to do, that it was an aggregate race and that he needed to push harder. Yeah. So, uh, But definitely one of Damon Hill's greatest drives and he's going to get in this 1994 Benetton. This is going to be really, really cool to see this, uh, to see this happening. It and I was thinking, it's actually quite appropriate it's raining because Schumacher was something of a rainmeister, wasn't he? Was, he was, absolutely right. For yes. me, his most iconic win in, for Ferrari was his first in that pouring wet race at Barcelona in 1996. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's not unkeeping with, with Schumacher. There's a damp track out there. That's something you don't see very often because normally these days the Formula One car is in its garage, yeah. um, his drive, but uh, if you've been standing on wet tarmac, you need the soles of your boots dried before you get onto the uh, pedals. Don't want your feet to slip, so... Damon Hill, former president of the British Racing Drivers Club, badge on his overalls, gets into the Michael Schumacher Benetton and will get instructions from the marshals. But fabulous that despite their rivalry, despite all that happened, not only uh, that season, but, uh, but for the rest of, of, of their careers as rivals, that uh, Damon is not only taking part in this, but has uh, 
accepted the invitation to drive the car that took that 1994 world crown. Time is a wonderful healer. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you say, their rivalry went, went on a little bit, didn't it? Because uh, you had 1997 when Hill was in the uncompetitive arrows, overtaking Schumacher for the lead right, yeah. at the Hungara ring. There was, a, there was a time, I think it was Suzuka 1998, where uh, Damon has subsequently admitted that on purpose he was not getting out of the way of <laughs> Schumacher when Schumacher came to lap him. And I think he, uh, he used, put the rudest word possible to describe what he was driving like uh, subsequently. This was on Twitter just a, a year or so ago. Okay. So uh, that rivalry kind of simmered for, for a long time as we look at Mark Genet getting ready to, to get in that car. And remember, you know, us here in the commentary box and every single British television viewing person listening to these words were encapsulated by Murray Walker and Murray really did get hold of the British Mansell era and then the Damon era and it was that battle that we that went just beyond the motor racing normal fan you know Damon versus Michael was BBC Sports personality of the year level stuff and uh, you know, we, were, we were so encapsulated with, uh, with how it was going to shake out with Williams, with a British-based Benetton squad as well, yeah. etc. Yeah, and no matter who you supported in Formula One, we've all got a soft spot for Ferrari, particularly as they hadn't won for so long. So we all supported Ferrari, whether or not you still supported Damon in another car. There was, a, there was lots going on. But go back to 1994, Damon Hill just touched on this. It was such a tumultuous season because mm. you had dramas pre-season in testing with accidents. You had, as Damon said, that <coughs> horrific weekend at Imola. There was Pedro Lamy's big accident after that. There was the fuel fire in Germany. There was Michael's exclusion from the British Grand Prix eventually for overtaking on the two warming up laps for the, for the twice attempted start race. Carl and, Wendlinger's uh, crash. Wendlinger yeah. What I was going to say was, you, you, because of, uh, really, of, sadly, Imola, um, it had that perverse effect of yeah. more people becoming aware of Formula One. So all this was being played out in front of an even bigger audience, mm. uh, which perhaps heightened the drama of that championship showdown in 1994. Yeah, indeed. There's a, there's a really good book, actually, from the period uh, in which, which Dame wrote, I think, with John Nicholson taking the, the photographs called, Try. I can't remember, I think it was called Grand Prix Year, I think. Yeah, and then so, they did yes, another one yes. two years later called My Championship. It's, it's just an, an amazing insight into, into what was going on that season because Hill said he, he wasn't the team leader. You know, he's come in as teammate to Ed and Senna. Previously, he's been with Alain Prost. He's not the number one driver in suddenly he is. Uh, just as his father had to do it after Jim Clark's done and it was Damon's only second year. We've hardly given much mention to, to Mika Hakkinen, who won the championship 98-99. Yeah. You know, mm. he beat Michael, and Michael took a lot towards the end of the year towards uh, to, to get that championship. But uh, there was so much going on. Well, need to be careful not to get run over down here. That's Mark Janay pulling away in the 2003 Ferrari. Mark, of course, was Michael's test driver there. There's Robbie Carr pulling out. Now here's Damon Hill, look at that, in the Benetton B194. That is the car in which Michael Schumacher crashed into Damon at Adelaide in 1994. Michael, of course, won that world championship and Damon lost it. But that's Michael's Formula Ford from, I couldn't even tell you the date off the top of my head, but there's just so much history down here. Absolutely wonderful to see it. Firing down through the bales as we move to the Michael Schumacher era. Uh, as we were reflecting on his career, I didn't mention, but perhaps should, that uh, Michael is one of the few overseas drivers to be an honorary member of the British Racing Drivers Club in uh, recognition of his Formula One achievements. And it is uh, Marc Genet in this car that is going to be the first up the hill in this batch. This is the first time we've seen this this weekend. This is the F2003 GA. So this was a car that actually Rubens Barrichello claimed was his favourite. It was a tough year that year in 2003. You had a very fast McLaren in the hands of uh, Kimi Raikkonen. You also had the Williams getting up and amongst it with the likes of Juan Pablo Montoya and Ralph Schumacher. So it wasn't a straightforward season 2003 for the Ferrari team compared to 2002 and 2004. So great to have that car up on the circuit for the first time this weekend. Uh, well, the Rubens used to win it on the that year, wasn't yeah. it, in the interrupted race with safety cars and people on the track but uh, in the Rubens win but very much from Michael's successful era with Ferrari and uh, Marc Genet a regular at the festival behind the wheel of the car. His fourth title uh, in that car for Michael Schumacher. 
jacket. And of course, it's another, in a sense, to go into our unofficial Marlborough badge because of the <laughs> yeah. uh, livery. Although the word, well, words uh, weren't there on either side, you did have very definitely the colour scheme. So great to have Mark Genet driving that car. And now we have a Ferrari that uh, wasn't related to Michael Schumacher. This was a car that raced in 1989, five races. With Gerhard Berger at the wheel. It's owned and run by uh, Holger Langer, who has a whole selection of V12s. And this 1989 Ferrari, the first with the semi-automatic gearbox. And then the uh, the next year would go on to the to the to the stunning looking 641. The first year that it had that semi-automatic gearbox, they went to Rio, they'd had terrible reliability in testing. Mansell booked his flight early before the end of the Grand Prix because he was so convinced he wasn't going to win it. He did win it from 12th position. What a fairy tale. Exactly. Slightly skewed the season though, because the expectation was there and it, I'm afraid, dipped from then on in. And apparently it wasn't the gearbox all along, it was something to do with the flexing the crankshaft, big long crankshaft of course, and uh, something to do with the oil pump pressure relief, but uh, that was feeding the gearbox in the first place. But he didn't believe he was going to win the race, yeah. had to move his flight, because, <laughs> oh, I've won it. This is the 1997 Ferrari being driven by Robbie Kerr. This was the car that Michael Schumacher almost won his first world title in for Ferrari. But look at this, Damon Hill on slick tyres in the wet, <laughs> in the Benetton Ford V194 that so famously collided with him at Adelaide to win Schumacher's first world title. And that season, and it was Anton Senna that was convinced initially that there were all sorts of extra aids on this car. <laughs> Going well, I was just thinking, Damon's about to find out. I mean, he stood trackside, having gone off the road in the Pacific Grand Prix, Aida, and listened to the car and said there's something about that, and he was absolutely convinced that it had all sorts of extra trickery. Do you think Damon's sitting there going through all those pages till he gets to page 199 or whatever it was in the What does this button do? Yeah. What does this one do? Then there was the famous plank incident at Spa, and uh, Damon taking the car into the paddock rather than going to the top of the hill, but he has been very much part of our Michael Schumacher moment, uh, remembering a great career of a great driver. Wonderful to see Damon Hill driving that car. It's so alien, isn't it, when you see different helmets in different... It was 94 as well, wasn't it, where mm. David Coulthard lost his crash helmet or something and ended up racing in his McLaren Marlboro with Michael Schumacher's helmet. Right, that's right, you're absolutely spot on. Alan Law, great uh, campaigner, former German Formula 3 star, DTM race winner, uh, race winner in the European Truck Racing Championship. Uh, Alan really, really great character, and uh, she's behind the wheel of the type of Mercedes from the 2.5 litre DTM that Michael drove, and uh, Hockenheim had a slightly wayward moment at the first corner of the last round, drilled Johnny Ciccotto, who therefore didn't win the championship, and it went to a Mercedes driver that year, uh, but uh, the green and white striped Mercedes 190 Evolution up through Vulcan, and this illustrating, as we were saying earlier, the versatility of Michael Schumacher, that he drove not just Formula One cars, single-seaters, but touring cars and Group C sports cars as well. And this is why it all made sense when it came full circle in 2010 for him to rejoin Mercedes, because yeah. his career had started with Mercedes, with the Sauber run Mercedes cars, uh, at the mall, and that's why it all kind of made sense. And this is where it all started yeah. in car racing. Back in 1988, the British built Van Diemen. Uh, this from the German and European Championships that Billy Bergmeister's team operated the car for Michael Schumacher in. Uh, and the car of uh, Richard Wilson making its way up the hill. It's a car from a multi-chassis single-seater era with a Ford Kent 1600cc engine, which was why it was Formula Ford 1600. Everybody had the same engine, different tuners, uh, and then the different designers came up with uh, the most slippery of shapes. By this stage, Van Diemen was taking on Reynard and the American Swift concerned that Van Diemen's were still the cars to have. So, yeah, Lewis Perez Compank in his at Schumacher Ferrari heads up the hill and the complex race driver himself. And this was the all conquering 2004 Ferrari, won 15 of the 20 races that year. This is up there with the MP44 from 1988, uh, the McLaren car that won 15 of the 16 races. Uh, it's up there with probably this year's Mercedes as being one of the most dominant Formula One cars of all time. Before that, before the AGM McLaren, you probably got to go back to the Jim Clark here and find car so dominant. So we've uh, absolutely adored watching these Formula One cars and also appreciating the sound that they have made. 